one function that's really important in certain applications of math is e to the x times sine of x. So I would really like to know what the derivative of this function is. And if I know what the derivative of e to the x is and what the derivative of sine of x is, which I do, they're both fairly simple. Um, if I know those two derivatives, then my hope, my hypothesis is that if I take the derivative of e to the x times sine of x, that will just be equal to the derivative of e to the x times the derivative of sine of x. So really I hope that if I take the derivative of a, fun of a function f times a function g, then I'll get out the derivative of f times the derivative of g. Um, the only way I have to check this really is to either look at specific examples to disprove it or to use the definition of derivative to prove it. So um, before I try to take use the, the definition of derivative to prove this, I'm going to look at specific examples, or at least one specific example. Um, a really simple one, a lot easier than e to the x times sine of x is, what if I have the derivative of x times x? Then if my hypothesis is true, then this is just equal to the derivative of x times the derivative of x. And I know the derivative of x is 1, so this would just be equal to 1 times 1. And now, is that true? If it's true, then I can say, yeah, my, my hypothesis probably is correct, and I can check it. Um, but is it true? The derivative of x times x is uh, the derivative of x squared, which is 2x. It's not equal to 1. So my hypothesis failed terribly on the first example that I looked at. Um, so now I'm left wondering, is there even a rule here? Is there a pattern? I take the derivative of f times g, it's not f prime times g prime. Is there any pattern? There may not be, um, but just to kind of see if there is one, I'm going to go ahead and use the definition of derivative to try to make something come out of it. And if I can't, then that's all right. So if I want to use the definition of derivative, um, first, I'm going to assume that I can find the derivative of f and I can find the derivative of g. So both of those functions have to be continuous at the points that I'm looking at. That means that if I take the limit as delta x goes to 0 of the change in f, that has to be 0. And the same thing with the g's. All right, so the derivative of f times g is the limit as the change in x goes to 0 of y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, basically. y2 minus y1 here. The y2 is f of x plus delta x times g of x plus delta x. And the y1 is f of x times g of x. And then x2 minus x1, that's just the change delta x. So um, I could try to do something with this, but... There's really nothing that I can do from here that I can see. I mean, maybe I can break this apart and analyze it, but I don't really see it simplifying in any way. So I'm going to change my perspective here a little bit. Um, the y2 part, I'm going to rewrite. Instead of thinking of f of x plus delta x, I'm going to write it as f of x, the original y value, plus change in f, the change in the y values. So then my y2 becomes, in parentheses, f of x plus delta f times, in parentheses, g of x plus delta g. And then I still have minus f of x times g of x. And I'm dividing by delta x still. And I'm going to take the limit as delta x goes to 0, all of that. So now I have something that I can actually multiply out here in the numerator. Um, let's go ahead and multiply this out. When you do that, you see that out in front, you have an f of x times g of x. And then at the end, you have a minus f of x times g of x. So those will cancel. And now, for the rest of it, there are no other terms that will combine. So what I'm going to do is split this up into different fractions. And then for each fraction, I'm going to rewrite it a little bit so that something I can see something nice coming out of it. And now for these first two fractions, um, you can see that 
well, for the first one, for example, the f of x doesn't change as delta x goes to zero. f of x is just what it is. It has no change of x in it. So it's a constant with respect to the change of x. I can, it doesn't change. I can pull it out in front of the limit. So that first term turns into just f of x times the limit as delta x goes to zero of the change in f over the change in x. And then the second term turns into something similar. And the third term, something similar as well. Actually, the third term, both of the pieces of that third term um, are affected by the change in x. As the change in x shrinks to zero, the change in f also does something. Since we assumed that f is continuous, because we're assuming we can take the derivative of f, that means that as delta x shrinks to zero, delta f also has to shrink to zero. Um, so both terms in the product of that last piece are affected by the delta x. Now, um, if we think about what we're seeing here, something really nice is coming out of this. This first term, notice, it's just f of x times the derivative of g. And then the second term is similar. It's just g of x times the derivative of f. And then what's that third term? When you let delta x shrink to zero, what do you get? Well, you get zero times the derivative of g. That's just zero. So we're left with g of x times f prime of x plus f of x times g prime of x. So it looks like there is an, a nice pattern. I mean, it's fairly simple. It's definitely not what I expected in my hypothesis, but it is still fairly simple. And uh, it should work. Let's try it out on our little simple example that we looked at earlier, x squared. If I take the derivative of x times x, if this rule is correct, then it's telling me that I should take x times the derivative of x plus x times the derivative of x. So that's x plus x is 2x, and that really is the derivative of x squared. So it did work there. Uh, it may be a little unclear for you to see because both f and g were the same, um, the same function there. So let's change it to x cubed. Let's break up x cubed as x times x squared. So f of x will be x, g of x will be x squared. And let's take the derivative of that product using this rule that we've figured out, this pattern. So if we do that, then it says that we should take x times the derivative of x squared plus the derivative of x squared times x. So we've got x times 2x plus x squared times 1. So that gives us 2x squared plus x squared is 3x squared. And that is the derivative of x cubed. So it looks like this thing really does work. Um, it does. The math that we did to calculate it was correct. So this pattern works every time. This is called the product rule. This is especially nice for functions that show up as products like e to the x times sine of x. Now we're confident that we can take the derivative of this uh, without going through a really long process. We just follow this quick pattern.